Welcome to Postcards, a brief look at people, places, the arts and curiosities from around the world. On today's program, the world's biggest ever art competition. 40,000 teenagers participate in live drawing classes. Distinctly different hotels, unusual places to stay from lighthouses to lockups. A new exhibition features the age-old Japanese method of timekeeping. And finally, a new gallery, aptly named Investigate. But first up, contemporary Brit art. Artists gathered together to celebrate the launch of Tate Britain at Millbank. It's a unique opportunity, which brings together some of the household names of the 21st century art scene, including Enfant Terrible, Tracy Emin. History was also made inside, with the official launch of the new gallery by Minister for the Arts, Alan Haworth. To celebrate the opening, Tate Britain has mounted the finest exhibition of British art in the world. Representing Britain 1500 to 2000 shows the astonishing range of the collection and covers the earliest. This rather kitsch still life painted in the 1620s by Nathaniel Bacon to this modern, haunting version of a young girl by Australian artist Ron Muick, completed two years ago. It's an exhibition of contrasts, which will feature a series of themes like landscape, war portraiture and literature. The displays will look at how artists have responded to that single theme over the course of time. The great strength of the exhibition is its range and its juxtaposition of traditional Victorian paintings like these with the Tracy Emmons. And Hockney's Bigger Splash. It's a stunning reminder of the range and variety in British art. There's also room for sculpture. This bronze by Jacob Epstein, one of the great innovators of 20th century art and Peter Lanyon's construction for Lost Mine, made in the 1950s. For the lover of traditional art, there are the Constables and the Turners. For the social historian, there are the works which chronicle the Industrial Revolution as an exciting event at the time. Contrast between old and new comes from Hogarth's classic, The Roast Beef of Old England. And cartoonist Steve Bell's reinterpretation of the same scene with John Major during the BSE crisis. It's a rewarding exhibition which throws up some startling images from the national psych. And to celebrate the launch of Tate Britain, the modern Brit pack signed a wall in one of the new galleries. There was general approval all round. How many of these will be remembered? It's an exciting time for British art in general, with Tate Britain now open and the new Tate Modern soon to open on Bankside. From the wilds of the Ecuadorian jungle to a stylish art gallery in London. The winner of the world's biggest ever art competition is a simple man who only started to paint five years ago and has completed only 20 pictures in his lifetime. Self-taught Raymond Pierre Guaje decided to paint the trees outside his isolated home in the heart of the Amazon basin. His paintings saw off the challenge of more than 22,000 amateur and professional artists from all over the world in the United Nations Millennium Art Exhibition. The international recognition of his work came as a huge surprise. 
When they told me that I had won the first prize in this worldwide competition, I felt strange and happy and I told my family all about this. That, I think, will go down in our history. The idea was for artists to paint an image of their country in the year 2000. The judges said the quality of the results was staggering. But it was one man's fragile and intricate image of the Amazonian jungle which had the most impact. The UN plans to show the paintings around the world, partly to raise money for children's charities and to demonstrate that despite conflicts, we all share one earth and that art is a universal language. One man's vision of his world has brought about, for him anyway, a very different scene. Having delivered his personal message, Raymond Piaguaje leaves London's sprawling urban jungle and returns to his own. Members of the band Blur join teenagers in a life drawing class at the Royal Academy of Art. Promotion for an exhibition of nude drawings called simply Alive. Alex James was too shy to put pen to paper, but Graham Coxon, who designed the covers for Blur's album 13, turned a practiced hand to drawing. Three band members formed a drawing club during early promotional tours. Over the last 10 years, the Royal Academy and the Occult Outreach Program has taken day-long intensive drawing workshops to around 40,000 schoolchildren across Britain. Alive is a selection of their charcoal drawings, covering themes like gesture, process, narrative, interpretation and environment. The works on display are distinct, diverse and definitely experimental. The aim of the program is to take students back to their early stages of childhood, where drawing was one of their primary means of communication. They're encouraged to suspend judgment on their work and to be more free in their interpretation and expression. The sale of a collection of sumptuous oriental carpets is the highlight of a week focusing on Islamic works of art at Christie's Auction House. The carpets come from across the present and former Muslim world, from Mughal India to Moorish Spain. Despite the vagueness of the term oriental, when applied to carpets it does denote identifiable characteristics. Transylvania in the 17th century, when this carpet was made, a largely Christian area, form part of the Ottoman Empire. Carpets there were more than mere works of art. One of the gems of the sale is this Persian rug, made with silk and metal thread, dating from the late 19th century. Reputedly made for the Shah Muzaffar al-Din, it has verses by the classical poet Hafiz running round the border. This 17th century carpet from India shows the influence of Persian design in the art of Mughal India. Carpets like it can be seen in the many miniature paintings depicting the court of Akbar, Jahangir and the other Mughal emperors of India. And it's not only carpets from the Islamic world that are in demand. This wooden panel from the minibar of the 13th century mosque of Im Tulun in Cairo sold for a staggering $850,000 US. An Englishman's home, they say, is his castle, or a windmill, or a magistrate's court and jail. even a Pullman railway car.
The historic wool town of Bradford-on-Avon in Wiltshire, in the southwest of Britain, is the home of a holiday company with a difference. In fact, it's called Distinctly Different and specialises in some very unusual accommodation. Like this 19th century windmill. It belongs to the founders of Distinctly Different, Peter and Priscilla Roberts. They list more than 40 unusual places to stay, from lighthouses to lock-ups, and have already achieved an international reputation. The idea came to them from their own experiences travelling the world and wanting to stay somewhere a little different from the standard bed and breakfast. The main circular lounge, it's a favourite for visitors from all over the world. Built in 1806, it was defunct just a decade later, a victim of the depression which followed the Napoleonic Wars. The bedrooms continue the circular theme, even down to the bed itself. The windmill has walls which are three feet thick, built of mellow Cotswold stone. It has a long history, built by a local baker, Thomas Smart, who wanted to cut out the middleman and get the flour ground at his own cost, rather than buying it from somebody else. The windmill is just one of the properties in the distinctly different catalogue, which has built up a considerable following. Bradford-on-Avon dates back to Roman times, and is a magnet for tourists even in the rain. The Norman Bridge has a chapel on it which was later converted to a prison. From one jail to another, this used to be the local magistrate's court in the Somerset village of Temple Cloud. Now the court deals with a different kind of visitor. The high vaulted ceiling looks down on the innocuous pleasures of the guests. In a previous incarnation, proprietor Nancy Hampson was a merchant banker for the United States. Now she's busy preparing a meal for her guests. And the German visitors, or prisoners, seem very appreciative. It's hardly the usual jail fare. Downstairs in the cells, it's a wintry scene. And there's even a reminder of the penalties for swearing. Some guests, it seems, enjoy being locked up. But it's not really a hardship in these ensuite cells. Coffee is delivered through rather than to the door. The food is certainly an improvement on that offered in a real prison and you don't have to clean your cell. It's all part of the service. There are not many magistrates courts where you can enjoy a jacuzzi while the warders or parents are away. The old court certainly qualifies as being distinctly different, set as it is in a delightful Somerset village. So is this small but perfectly formed castle. Bath Lodge has a Union Jack fluttering over the battlements. Like all good English castles, it has those hidden away ramparts, ideal for taking tea or coffee. The proprietors, Graham and Nicola Walker, bought the lodge when they left high pressure jobs in the city of London. They haven't regretted the move. It was originally a gate lodge for a large manor and straddled the road. Every day, Graham raises the flag over the castle. Guests revel in the high life of a castle with authentic stone walls, swords and armour. Widbrook Grange in Wiltshire. It's an example of how enterprising proprietors John and Pauline Pierce have taken a dilapidated 18th century farmhouse and transformed it into a luxury hotel. With swimming pool, and conference facilities.
Petworth in West Sussex is a pretty English village, popular with residents and tourists alike. The railway station used to play host to Edward VII's royal visitors, who came here for the horse racing at nearby Goodwood. Today, the station has a very different function. The waiting room has been transformed into a lounge for visitors. The fireplace and decor recall a bygone age of elegance and steam trains. The Pullman cars at the end of the track were built in the late 19th century and make ideal tourist accommodation. Inside there's an opulence which qualifies the accommodation for its distinctly different tag. The bedroom recalls the days when horseless carriages clattered their way to Goodwood. In the bathroom there's all mod cons. The fixtures and fittings all recreate the period charm. even down to a British rail toilet roll holder. Breakfast in the waiting room. The old railway station is just one of the 40 or so properties throughout Britain, which offers travellers from around the world that distinctly different place to stay. So what are the cultural icons of the millennium? At this busy shopping centre in Guildford in the Surrey Commuter Belt, the local council and other organisations have brought together the artefacts they feel sum up the century. A local policeman's helmet and local history books make sure Guildford is not forgotten. Some of the most evocative exhibits are personal like sprinter Alan Wells' running shoes when he won the Olympic 100 metres in Moscow. The display has attracted a lot of attention from shoppers. The vault will also house letters to people in the year 3000. And on this side, workmen are preparing a special vault. A mini car, which was voted the car of the century, will go on a time voyage to the year 3000. The mini and other memorabilia were bricked up in this special vault in March and will not be opened again until 3000 dawns. We take it for granted that everyone in the world today measures time in hours and minutes, but it was not always so. An exhibition at the British Museum explores the ancient Japanese timekeeping system. Under this age-old system, day and night were each divided into six periods of roughly two hours. But as the length of daylight varied with the seasons, clockmakers had to make constant adjustments. One way was to shift weights up and down these horizontal arms to alter the speed of the clock. The exhibition includes Japanese pictures and prints from the 17th to the 19th centuries, which also follow traditional forms. Many of these feature traditional clocks in the background. During the 300 years of the Edo period, there was a conservatism in Japan. This had an enormous effect on the development of Japanese culture. There was plenty of time, and as a result of this, apprenticeships were long, and the Japanese arts and crafts developed along very standard, non-changing lines. As commercial contact with Europe broadened, Japanese craftsmen had to find ways to adapt the mechanism of imported European clocks to accommodate the traditional system of timekeeping. The exhibition features these hybrids of European and Japanese timekeeping, another meeting of minds between two very different cultures. Three, two, one, pull! pull. A new $1.6 million US gallery has opened at the Natural History Museum. It gives visitors the opportunity to explore the real world in a way that has never been open to them before. Unlike most exhibitions, Investigate at the Claw Education Centre actively encourages everyone, especially children, to touch, feel, poke and prod all the exhibits. Investigate has been designed to reflect the research methods used by the 350 scientists who work at the museum. 
It's full of hundreds of specimens, including fossils, shells, rare stones, animal skins and insects. But the scope of the exhibition is not restricted to fossils. It includes a live area which changes with the seasons. In the courtyard, garden visitors can investigate living things and come face to face with a tadpole or even a big black beetle. But it's not just those who turn up at the museum who can get involved with the exhibition. The museum's website has all sorts of interactive activities. It provides the opportunity for people all over the world to contribute their different opinions and observations about the natural world. The gallery is equipped with 24 workstations and state-of-the-art measuring and magnifying instruments. But it's not just the things that you can see that are on hand to investigate. There is also the odd element of surprise. One of these boxes contained a dried snake skin. More and more museums and galleries are using human models to bring history to life. Chances are the mannequins on display are made by a British company, Gems Display Figures, the largest manufacturer of wax and character figures in the world. With a long-standing prestigious background, Gems has been in business since 1885, when its main concern was producing tailoring dummies for the royal families of Europe. Gems had the royal warrants for almost everyone in the aristocracy, including the Duchess of Edinburgh, the Tsarina and the Queen of Norway. During the First World War, the aristocracy no longer wanted to participate. This coincided with the emergence of department stores, and so wax heads and hands were put on the figures and the first shop display mannequins were created. Some of the staff currently working at GEMS have 40-odd years experience in the business. They produced the first department store dummies, fed the US wax museum market during the 1950s, and now focus on producing figures many which move through animatronics for historical displays. Today, these high-quality sculpted figures are being placed into academic museums and heritage centres around the world. GEMS can produce large numbers of figures in a relatively short time frame by choosing from its rather surreal-looking range of 100 stock faces in various poses. These can be manipulated and worked on to be turned into any figure past or present. This generic is being transformed into 70s soul singer Gloria Gaynor. Over 60 figures for the Royal Army Museum in Brussels is currently the major project. The display will depict the history of the Belgian Army and the Defence Forces of Europe in general. With advances in technology delivering cheaper, smaller and more reliable animatronics, the public can expect an even more spookily realistic and interactive experience with the past. And that's all for today. Join us again next time for a postcard look at interesting people, places, the arts and curiosities.